episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. We have another really fascinating show for you uh, on the biomimicry front today. Uh, as a little background, um, spider silk uh, is a, uh, a very unique protein fiber spun by spiders, obviously, which they use to make their webs with or other structures um, to catch other animals, to make cocoons, wrap up prey, and so forth, um, and obviously suspend themselves and glide away from, from predators. Um, spider silk is very unique uh, in the sense that um, it is optimized for incredible mechanical properties and biologic function, especially the drag line silk, which has really fascinating mechanical properties, uh, an extremely interesting combination of uh, high tensile strength and extendability. Uh, and on a weight per weight basis, uh, it's estimated that uh, spider silk tensile strength is several times that of steel. Uh, now, obviously in the Spider-Man comics, when Peter Parker has to get bitten by a radioactive spider to tap these possibilities, uh, but uh, we're gonna be dealing with a real person in the real world today. Uh, and that's why we're so happy to be joined today by Alex Greenhoff, uh, CEO of SpinTabs, uh, which is a spin out for the University of Oxford, which is pushing the boundaries of bio-inspired spinning and silk materials uh, to provide much needed solutions and sustainable uh, and technically advanced textiles. Uh, Alex is a biologist, also a programmer with a working background in microbiology, uh, in clinical trials with a, a focus on uh, GCP compliance and silk and protein science, where he's been a research assistant in the Oxford Silk Group for the last three years. Uh, his research experience includes the characterization of liquid silks and fibers uh, with different techniques, including looking at rheology, fluorometry, calorimetry, electrophoresis, and tensile testing. A lot of really interesting things to discuss today. So Alex, welcome uh, to the show today. Hi there, uh, thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Um, and this is a, it's been an extremely exciting topic for me, uh, you know, uh, over the years and just really glad to see uh, somebody uh, moving these, uh, this potential forward. Um, I was wondering, you know, we, we typically start off, we, we give our guests the floor for a little bit just to talk about themselves. If you can just sort of take us a little bit on uh, a journey about who you are, a little bit of your background and, and how you uh, develop these interests, not just in obviously biology, but uh, in this fascinating area of, of biotech and, and biotechnological mimicry, I think that'd be a great way to start out. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, for as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by the world around us. Um, I can remember one of uh, an early kind of Christmas gifts I got when I must have been about six or seven was a kind of kid's microscope that you could uh, kind of peer into the smaller aspects of the world. And yeah, I, I've always been fascinated um, by science. Uh, it's actually progressed. When I was much younger, I was very much into physics and the uh, potential of things such as nuclear fusion, space travel. Uh, as I got a bit older, I, I was very into chemistry and all the different uh, materials you can make using these different combinations and processes. And finally, when I started to be looking towards going into university, I got fascinated with biology, um, in particular microbiology, the very small things in nature um, abiogenesis was the area that really intrigued me. Um, so the kind of study of how life came into existence from non-living matter. Um, so there's been this kind of strange progression. I still have a huge amount of interest in uh, all the different scientific fields, but it's definitely become a lot more specific over time, um, finalizing really in this kind of protein world, which is perhaps even slightly smaller than the microbial world um, and silk has definitely been a fascinating material to delve deeper into. For one thing, as you said in the intro, there's a lot of different analytical techniques that you have to utilize uh, to try and understand it, which from the slightly nerdy perspective that I've always had, it's quite fun to use these kind of machines uh, to understand the material. But um, it's also been fascinating because that early interest I had in the uh, variety of scientific fields is really important to understanding silk as a material. 
you need to understand not only the kind of biological aspects for the evolutionary path that led to it, but also the, the material properties so you're getting into material science and the ways that you can get further analysis that are all relying on either chemistry fundamentals or uh, fundamentals of physics to kind of get through this invisible barrier to understand this uh, really unique small protein. Um, so it's been very gratifying for me to be able to go in from a biologist's perspective and expand my knowledge and understanding of other areas through this material. Wonderful, wonderful. And before we get into some of these uh, fascinating properties of, of, uh, of some of these spider silks and, and some of what you're doing with it, I, it was very interesting reading uh, in some of your materials. It was actually in an interview recently, and you were talking about how um, just traditional silk production, though we might not think about it, uh, it has an extremely high environmental impact. And you said that the only thing has more than that in the sort of textile area is leather production, which obviously uh, is, is incredibly impactful from that perspective. Talk a little bit, if you would, about sort of why uh, this type of production traditionally has been so uh, energy intensive and, and dirty in a context. And then a little bit on sort of uh, what your thinking is along these lines as you develop uh, the spin stack strategy? Yeah, it, it's a really interesting question because when we think about silk, fundamentally, we assume it should be a green material. You know, it's biodegradable, it's protein, it's natural. So in theory, it's a renewable material. Um, it should logically be far better than any of the petrochemical derived fibers that make up the majority of material used in textiles today. Um, but some LCAs, uh, so life cycle analysis of uh, the energy requirements to produce, uh, say a kilogram of silk, do show that it seems to require a huge amount of energy that is normally coming from quite polluting sources. And this is where a lot of the environmental impact of silk is found. Um, as to why that is, I personally believe a lot of it has come from the push to uh, mechanization and industrialization of a technology that is obviously thousands of years old. Uh, silk has been cultivated in China for at least 6,000 years. Um, so we, we know at one point it was probably when it was more of a cottage industry having very little impact actually environmentally. Um, but it's been this move towards industrial having huge vats of boiling water which are required to essentially reel the silk off the cocoon. The cocoon is almost an amazing example of natural 3D printing. It's a fiber extruded or well pultruded from the silkworm that has a glue around the fiber that allows it to build up into the 3D shape of the cocoon. But to remove the fiber which can be nearly a kilometer in length, it's all one continuous fiber inside the cocoon you have to soften the glue around it. And this normally requires large vats of very hot to boiling water. Normally there's some alkali chemicals added as well. And this is all just to allow the reading off of the uh, fiber. And this is really where we see the vast majority of the energy input in the silk industry. Um, predominantly, these vats are heated from electrical elements, which are already quite an inefficient way of converting electricity into heat always is very inefficient and predominantly the fuel source for these elements is coming from either coal or uh, shale oil so it's normally some of the dirtiest fossil fuels and this is where the co2 impact of the material comes from um, obviously we have to we have to be careful when we talk about environmental impacts of materials because lcas can vary dramatically depending on where you go for which end where do you do your cutoff point when you're looking at the energy usage? So it's hard to do direct comparisons between the energy usage of silk compared to something like polyester or polypropylene, which are very common plastics, um, because you may see in quite a few LCAs of the kind of petrochemical derived polymers, they may not include the actual impact from the mining or drilling and refining of the raw materials which could actually represent a very large energy input and also a very large CO2 output. So we have to be careful about kind of drawing lines. But based on the data we do have, this input of energy in silk is a problem. 
um, and is predominantly where the vast majority of the impact does lie. So if we can remove this energy input, then silk suddenly starts to look like a far more sustainable material than many of the other uh, possibilities. Um, it would have this kind of renewable beginning. Um, it would be biodegradable as a protein. It wouldn't shed any uh, uh, particles that will bioaccumulate in a harmful way like we see with plastics. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot to environmental impact um, depending on which areas you want to look at. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, moving now, uh, looking more at Spintex, you um, sort of you know incubated at um, at Oxford. I, I think you were at a, uh, an incubator nearby or within the university. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about um, uh, sort of the inception of the company, some of your your partners and scientific partners involved. And then, you know, I read a little bit about the fact that um, initially you're going to be looking at some of the very interesting sort of biomaterial opportunities uh, for this, uh, these types of materials in, in medical devices, regenerative medicine. Uh, talk a little bit about that, if you would. And then also just a subset of that, I, you know, I, in, the, in the sort of small amount that I followed of this area over the years, um, well, obviously protein production sort of was mastered. One of the things that you've been you know, successful in focusing on is actually this spinning, which is this, once again, this extremely evolution optimized it so well for the spider. It's been kind of tough for us. Talk a little bit about sort of some of your breakthroughs there with ultimately uh, the sort of uh, mimicking uh, these, these really micro spinning capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Spintex was started at the end of 2018. Um, However, I would say we've only truly started the full process of really uh, uh, growing and engaging in a way that will uh, really make an impact in the markets we're aiming for. Um, as I think many startup uh, founders will know, the route from inception and idea to funding and beginning the growth journey can take some time. and. Actually, it's very interesting uh, you mentioned around the kind of medical usages and the biomaterial biotextile. This was very much the focus of the company uh, when we first formulated it. Um, what we, we took the route that I think many startups also take, where we focused on a market that had potential high value possibilities and would require a slightly smaller scale. Um, this I think is a very normal approach, but what we found is although this can be possible, the regulatory burdens that you can hit as you go through the uh, medical industry can be very uh, difficult to deal with at an early stage in a startup's uh, life. Um, it can take a lot more capital and a lot more time than many startups will actually have. Um, and it was actually around this time, so to kind of give some more context on where we started, we are a spin out from the University of Oxford. We are also a spin out from a, a EU a Horizon 2020 project. Um, this project flipped was looking at spider silk spinning and trying to uh, apply this low energy textile production route to other biopolymers, including cellulose. Um, and we were part of the group in the university. This is actually where I met my co-founder, Martin Friedrich, um, as well as I was working with uh, another co-founder, Fritz Bolrath, who was the principal investigator of the research group. Um, and it was through this program and our kind of understanding of the requirements and how can you start actually replicating this kind of spider spinning approach that we formulated the idea for the company. And as I said, this was, uh, looking first towards medical usages, but um, we joined an accelerator uh, in around the middle of 2019 uh, called Fashion for Good, which is based out in Amsterdam. And um, this accelerator is very much geared towards connecting startups with brand partners um, in their ecosystem to take innovation and improve the face of fashion, improve the process of every different aspect of the fashion industry. So from raw materials to end of life. Um, and what we found going through that program was the USPs that we had uh, in terms of the reduction in energy consumption, 
possibilities about dealing with end of life, things that we were aware of but hadn't developed so much. We realized that these USPs were actually of huge significance to this particular market. And there was a level of support and a slightly easier regulatory journey to take. And alongside this, we had also developed more in our understanding and our processing to allow for the possibility of greater scale than we had originally envisioned. So it was a, a kind of really serendipitous moment where uh, many different aspects aligned together. And we found that actually, although we still have uh, a strong interest in the medical applications and will be pursuing these for our very first markets, we actually determined that uh, textiles in the fashion industry made the most sense for getting our technology to market and actually in people's hands as quickly as possible. It's very interesting because you mentioned the um, the fashion for good accelerator and this sort of the tremendous amount of um, clothes that we make by but we don't use them. Um, we lose them a lot less and they're filling up these landfills all over the place, burning them. Um, talk a little bit about sort of, obviously it's early on, but what do you see in terms of uh, sort of a first generation of uh, these types of fabrics? Would they be um, more for sort of uh, athletes or certain uh, sort of uh, climates? What, what are some of the, the sort of the, the short term things you're thinking about as sort of the, uh, not everything short term, but sort of the, the go to market opportunities, uh, any interesting yeah. niches that we might not think about? Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting because I think there's potential across an entire range of different sub sectors within fashion. The initial uh, market that springs to mind as the most uh, viable initially would be the markets where silk is traditionally used. Um, so very much in the Asian markets, as well as more of the uh, higher end, top tier fashion brands. These are traditional users of silk. And many of these brands have a really strong commitment to improving the environmental impact of the materials they're using. And currently within silk, there are very few options to improve the sustainability of the material. I think the only real option at the moment is organic silk, which really just removes some of the impact from the uh, farming process and doesn't really address some of the energy issues that come later in the material production. So there's a huge void within this particular material, which just hasn't been filled yet, despite the fact that there are several different uh, startups who have been uh, uh, around for many years attempting to address some of these issues. It's still very open, um, but I don't believe that that's the only use for this material within fashion. What we have at Spintex is a very unique opportunity in the sense that we have total control over our spinning process which means we can control the properties of our fibers almost as if they were a, a purely synthetic material. So we have this kind of control in the properties of the fiber that we, we've never really seen with natural textiles before. Um, and this opens up so many different possibilities, uh, particularly in those kind of um, uh, performance apparel markets where we can start thinking about some of the materials that by, uh, by force, we're essentially forced to use uh, synthetic materials because they have certain properties in terms of their, their stretch and their kind of elastic nature. And we can start to think about, can we actually replicate those properties with a natural material instead of using a synthetic material? Really neat, really neat. Um, Putting aside then, okay, so we have um, obviously the, 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 the short-term opportunity for the textiles, uh, a much higher sort of regulatory burden, rightly so, in, in regenerative medicine and, and uh, other biomaterials. Um, obviously nothing confidential, but uh, other interesting things that we might not think about, uh, putting aside all the Spider-Man stuff for a moment, we'll I'll get to that in a bit, but um, uh, obviously, um, you know, we've heard about, uh, you know, things in sort of the industrial space or I don't know, even if in the military with regard to, you know, the, there's always been that sort of 
comparison done that, you know, if you made a nice yeah. piece of this stuff, you could stop an airplane pretty fast on an aircraft carrier and all that bit. Um, take us into some of that, the the other areas we may not be thinking of, as long as obviously they don't uh, go into any confidential uh, no, intellectual absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. No, um, I, I think that's a great question because it, it really brings back to why have we been so obsessed with spider silk for so many years? Right. Um, and it really is fundamentally it is a very unique material in many ways. Um, the strength is obviously the aspect that a lot of people know, the five times stronger than steel, weight for weight. Um, but it's not actually, to my mind, the most impressive property of a spider silk. The most impressive property of a spider silk is its toughness which is uh, the ability of it to essentially absorb energy before it breaks. And this is a combination of how strong the material is, but also how much it can stretch before break. So when you start stretching something like a spider silk, you will actually get a deformation of the fiber. It will start to become thinner, as if you were stretching a plastic bag. And this is a way of absorbing energy within the material. And silk does this to a level that I don't think there is really any other material, natural or man-made, that comes close to that energy absorption. Um, and what this means is you have a material that can absorb a huge amount of energy, which makes it very interesting in advanced materials in composites, for example. Um, and you can also uh, use it in these kind of composites for things such as automotive, so high-performance cars or aerospace. Because not only do you have this toughness, but you have an incredibly light material that has very high strength. So the kind of ratio between strength to weight is extremely high. Um, and that actually makes it a potentially uh, interesting material beyond the kind of glass fibers or carbon fibers that are the kind of gold standard of composite manufacture right now. Um, I know one example that people always kind of think of is uh, body armor. So using spider silk as a component of body armor. Um, it would work, most likely. You would probably be able to stop a bullet, but the bullet would be several meters behind you because <laughs> the material will stretch. So you'll have the bullet go through. It will get caught by the web, but um, maybe not as useful. But that doesn't mean that the idea is completely without merit. It's, it allows for you to think in terms of how can we do different combinations, different composites of different materials? So Kevlar mixed in with something spider-like, and can that reduce the weight of the overall uh, garment while still providing the same amount of uh, uh, defense? So it's really one of these materials that I'm, I'm very excited about because once we have something that gets close to a spider silk, we will open so many new opportunities that we haven't even thought about. Very impressive. Um, now it's, coming back to you, I, you know, obviously you've um, you've put together a, a very impressive team, and um, you know you've been you've been involved in, uh, in in industry with in front of investors, obviously in academia. Uh, any specific folks aside from your your um, your founding team that you might want to mention or shout out to at this point that have been really influential? Uh, as this thing has gotten off the ground and uh, has begun, you know, begun its transition from laboratory ideas to this sort of industrialization process. Uh, it, yeah, it, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's, we are always the summation of those around us. Um, if I was to go into detail for every single person who has kind of aided in one way or another, um, you know, uh, either directly or indirectly, I think we could spend 30 minutes doing that. Sure. Um, I would definitely like to uh, say a big thank you to Chris Holland and Rob Harrison, who are also members of our advisory board, and they've been very supportive in the, uh, the initiation and uh, beginnings of uh, Spintex. Also, um, there have been many mentors both locally and internationally that we've worked with um we've just finished going through uh the indie bio program um which has been a great experience and the team over there did a great job with possibly one of the hardest years to run an accelerator in the middle of a global pandemic um yeah obviously uh my friends and family as well who have uh, 
put up with long days not seeing me or having to deal with uh, the stress that comes with uh, uh, starting a startup. Um, as I say, yeah, the, the list would be uh, truly endless if I had to thank absolutely everyone. <laughs> Understood. Understood. And yeah, unfortunately, the uh, the reality of, uh, as you were saying, sort of incubating new companies, uh, high risk companies, high tech companies in a pandemic is something that's <laughs> it new to all of us. But uh, yep. it definitely seems that uh, you're on the right road and um, just really inspiring seeing you, uh, as I said, after following these types of tools for, for a couple decades now, the fact they see it. Uh, make this transition is uh it's really fascinating when we'll be watching uh you and it's just really wishing you the best uh uh moving forward um for for everybody that's going to be uh watching this particular episode on uh the youtube channel or listening on the various uh podcast networks are uh, you listening to the ceo of the spintex company alex greenhouse uh doing really amazing things bio-inspired spinning and silk materials uh, in the textile business and longer term in regenerative medicine and biomaterials. Um, Alex, thank you for taking the time to uh, come on the show today and share bring. And, um, you know, I love, love once again, this, the, these things that, that we knew is science fiction or fantasy coming up. I don't want to call you Spider-Man, but uh, you're going to be in a very unique position of being the real Peter Parker <laughs> when all this comes to fruition. So, <laughs> No, uh, thank th you. Thanks, thanks for having uh, t taking the time out of your schedule. I know you got a lot going on. No, thank you. It, it was great fun. And uh, just to finish off, I, I just Please. wanted to show a little example of some of the fibers that we're producing right now. Wonderful. So, just finish to show that there's there's real there's real fibers behind the talk. So, <laughs> hey, <laughs> really great stuff. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks very much.